before we begin, don't forget that there are currently three applications out for the Queen's Gambit Decline available for iPhone and for Android. Welcome back to ChessOpenings.com. In today's video, I'd like to share a game with you that I played against the international master Siddharth Ravachindran in the semi-slav opening. The semi-slav opening begins with the moves pawn to d4, pawn to d5, pawn to c4, pawn to c6, and now white can choose between either knight to c3, as I played in the game, having the white pieces, or the move knight to f3. In this game, I continue knight to c3, knight to f6 was played, knight to f3 was played, and now the signature move of the semi-slav, the move pawn to e6. Throughout this video, we're going to discuss some of the subtleties which go along with the semi-slav opening, and then we're going to take a look at a game which at the time was my highest rated victory when it was played in Los Angeles in 2011. In this game, I was able to demonstrate some of the downsides of the semi-slav for black, while my opponent was able to ups uphold some of the positive aspects of this opening. And by the way, it's my belief that the semi-slav is black's strongest reply to the queen's pawn opening. Therefore, this position is going to be very topical for us to look at today. Let's take a look. The semi-slav opening is a reply to the queen's pawn opening, which begins with the move pawn to d4. And with this move, if given the opportunity, white would like to set up a central pawn duo with the move pawn to e4. Black has two major ways of replying to the queen's pawn opening, which are both based on preventing this move pawn e2 to e4. One reply is the move knight to f6. Another reply is the move pawn to d5 as played in the game. And again, in both cases, white, black is looking to prevent white from occupying the e4 square with a pawn. Now, after the move pawn to d5, white's most common reply is the queen's gambit beginning with the move pawn to c4. And this is what was played in the game. With the move pawn to c4, White is putting additional pressure on the d5 pawn, and he's threatening to play. Pawn takes pawn on d5, whereupon, after black recaptures on the d5 square, white could then play knight to c3, and again, he could achieve the move pawn to e4. And therefore, black most often replies to the move pawn to c4 with some method of defending the d5 pawn. One way that he might continue is the move pawn to e6, and this would lead to an opening known as the queen's gambit decline. We've already taken a look at this in a couple of opening tutorial apps which are available on iPhone and Android, but at this time we have not yet released any videos which have described this particular opening. Another option for black is to play the move pawn to c6 and this is slightly more preferred at the top levels. I believe the best explanation for why this move, pawn to c6, the Slav defense, is preferred for black hinges upon two reasons. One reason is that black has not yet blocked the light squared bishop on the c8 square, and so it's very possible that the bishop could find an outpost on f5 or potentially on g4, and this happens in some of the mainline variations. Another, more subtle, hidden factor behind the move pawn to c6 is that black is also protecting the square on b5 with this pawn on c6, and it turns out that in many cases, black actually is renewing the threat of capturing on c4 because in that event, He's threatening to rapidly support the pawn with b7 to b5. And I'm going to show some examples of this in just a moment. Continuing on with how the game unfolded, white played the move knight 
to C3. Now, it's already possible for black to play the move pawn takes pawn on C4 here. And then he may attempt to reply to the move pawn to E4 with pawn to B5. Again, this is demonstrating the value of having the pawn on C6 in this position. But in this particular case, the situation is just a little bit too unstable for black to do this straight away. White would be able to continue with pawn to a4, attacking the b5 pawn. Black most often plays b4. And now after knight to a2, white tends to have very little difficulty regaining the pawn on c4, and he has achieved the central pawn duel on e4 and d4. And this position is well known to lead to an initiative for white. Instead, after the move knight to c3, it's most common for black to play the move knight to f6, simply getting on with his development. But now, after white plays knight to f3, the most common move here, black can now play the move pawn takes pawn on c4, and under these conditions, if white plays pawn to e4, now we're starting to see how the idea of b7 to b5 can be crucial. In this case, it's not so easy for white to continue with pawn to a4, since now after pawn to b4, the pawn on e4 is indirectly under attack because the pawn on b4 is attacking the knight on c3. Therefore, after this move, pawn takes pawn on c4, white's most common reply is the move pawn to a4, which is designed to prevent the move pawn to b5. And in this well-known position, black most often takes the opportunity to bring his bishop out to f5, which also prevents the move pawn to e4 and develops the bishop. And only after pawn to e3 or knight to e5 does white recover the c4 pawn, but black can argue that he's managed to develop his light squared bishop, and he's also managed to provoke the move pawn to a4 which often gives black an outpost on the b4 square, and this is known as the Slav proper. In fact, in the particular game which I'm demonstrating today between myself and the international master Siddharth Ravachadran, I instead played the move order pawn to e3, which is designed to prevent this idea of pawn takes pawn on c4. Now, after pawn to e3, black has a few different options which he can use, but the most common is to play the move pawn to e6. And it also turns out that if white plays the move knight to f3, it's also most popular for black to play the move pawn to e6. And in both cases, we have what's known as the semi-slav variation. Now, you may wonder why would black choose to bring his pawn out to the e6 square, blocking the bishop on c8, when he has an opportunity to play for the idea of bishop to f5? In fact, the idea of the semi-slav is to intensify this threat of capturing on c4. If black had the right to move once again, he could now capture the pawn on c4, and once again, just as we described, if white were to play pawn to e4, black would have the move pawn to b5. And this would be quite a pleasant situation for black. He's up a pawn, and white needs to worry about the possibility of b4 followed by knight takes e4. And in such a case, white is already at a demerit, at a downside in this position. And in this case, again, keeping in mind that we've given black a free tempo, in this case, if, black were to, if white were to try the move pawn to a4, designed to prevent the move pawn to b5, now the point of this move, e7 to e6, is revealed as black can now bring the bishop out to the b4 square, thereby reestablishing control of the b5 square. Since the knight is currently pinned, it's still not an option for white to play, let's say, pawn to e3, because now black would have the move pawn to b5. And if, for example, 
white were to try bishop to d2. Black could still go for the move pawn to b5, since now, after pawn takes pawn on b5, black could simply insert the capture bishop takes c3, and now, no matter how white replies, again, black remains a pawn up. So it turns out that after the move knight to f3 and pawn to e6, black has intensified the threat of capturing on c4 by opening the bishop up on f8. And this guarantees that he will be able to follow up with the move pawn to b5 in the event of pawn to a4 if he has the bishop on b4. Thus it turns out that in the semi-slav after knight f3, pawn to e6, white's most natural move, bishop to g5, can now be met with pawn takes pawn on c4, picking up a pawn on c4, or in certain cases, black can also insert the move pawn to h6, and then only after bishop to h4 does he take on c4. And both of these options are well known to theory and will not be the topic of today's video. For today, it's enough to note that the move pawn to e6 contains the threat of pawn takes pawn on c4 by virtue of opening up the dark squared bishop. And it's for this reason that white's most common and probably his strongest move in the semi-slav is to continue with the move pawn to e3, defending the pawn on c4. And this is very interesting because by having played the move pawn to e6, blocking in his own light squared bishop, for the first time in the queen's gambit, we see white is actually pretty much forced to block in his own dark squared bishop since the lines with bishop to g5 tend to lead to complications which are known to be more or less okay for black. In the game which was played, instead white just plays the move pawn to e3 right away anyway, since there are not any ways for black to exploit the fact that white has already hampered in this dark squared bishop. For example, if black were to try to bring his bishop out to the f5 square, this is in fact not such a good move, since after pawn takes pawn on d5, pawn takes pawn on d5, queen to b3, the pawn on b7, which is newly abandoned thanks to the fact that black has brought his bishop out to f5, this pawn on b7 is a bit uncomfortable for black to defend. He'll either need to create weaknesses with the move pawn to b6, or if he attempts to move his queen to c8 or c7, he'll drop the pawn on d5. Therefore, it's not common for black to bring his bishop out to the f5 square, and instead, he often either plays pawn to e6, or in certain cases, he may try pawn to g6, developing this bishop in a different way, or pawn to a6, again attempting to achieve the move pawn to b5 through another means. But most common is for black to play the move pawn to e6, and now, after knight to f3, as played in the game, we've transposed into the semi-slav opening with the move pawn to e3 having already been decided upon. Black continued with the move knight b to d7. And now from here, white has a choice between the move bishop to d3, simply getting on with development, or the move queen to c2. The downside of this move, bishop to d3, is that it allows black to once again demonstrate the value of being able to play b7 to b5 by now playing pawn takes pawn on c4, bishop takes pawn on c4, pawn to b5 attacking the bishop, bishop to d3, and now after pawn to a6 defending the b5 pawn, black is very very close to achieving the move c6 to c5 and then bringing his light squared bishop out to the b7 square. This is very, very different from the queen's gambit declined, where black very often struggles to find a good placement for his light squared bishop. Instead, in this variation of the semi-slav, black very often finds that his ability to achieve the move b7 to b5 and also c6 to c5 
allows him to find a very, very active diagonal for this bishop, and these positions are very difficult for white to prove any kind of advantage in. I'm pointing this out because throughout the game, it turns out to be very important for black whether or not he can bring this light squared bishop out. And in fact, he really struggles with the placement of this piece throughout the particular game which I'm showing today. So the key to understand here is that if white plays bishop to d3, black has the move, pawn takes pawn on c4, followed by b7 to b5. In the game, I instead played a slightly more popular variation known as the anti-Moran. If white plays bishop to d3, we have the Moran variation after d takes c4, bishop takes c4, pawn to b5. And if white plays the move queen to c2, we have a variation which is known as the anti-Moran, as white is intentionally avoiding developing the light squared bishop for at least one tempo in order to try to avoid this straightforward plan of pawn takes pawn on c4, b7 to b5, and then an eventual c6 to c5 move. Now if black were to try the move pawn takes pawn on c4, in the first place, white would save a tempo as his bishop could now directly come out to the c4 square. And white would also benefit from the position of his queen on c2. For example, if black were to try b7 to b5, let's say bishop to e2, pawn to a6, now there are different ways which white could play this position which would disallow black from going for the straightforward c6 to c5. I won't describe this in too much detail here. It's sufficient to note that white has saved a tempo in this position and he's brought his queen out to a fairly active location on c2. And for example, white might even try the move knight to d2, followed by bringing a knight to the e4 square. All of these different things become possible because the queen is on c2 and white has saved a tempo. Therefore, after the move queen c2, black most commonly replies by bringing his bishop out to the d6 square, and this was played in the game. Now white continued, bishop to d3, castle's kingside was played, castle's kingside, and now pawn takes pawn on c4, bishop takes pawn on c4, pawn to b5, and now bishop to e2. So one of the differences here is that now that the bishop has been called out to the d6 square, there's a little bit of a complication for black in achieving the move pawn to c5. For example, if black were to play the move pawn to a6, which is pretty reasonable in this position, after, let's say, rook to d1, white is threatening to play pawn to e4 and bring the pawn up to the e5 square. And for this reason, black most often needs to be willing to bring his e-pawn up to the e5 square whenever white plays the move pawn to e4. Well, if black is going to bring his e-pawn up to the e5 square, he most often cannot also at the same time accomplish the move c6 to c5, at least not immediately. Since, let's say after e4, e5, and then at some later time pawn to c5, White will always be able to bring the pawn clear up to the d5 square. And also, black always also needs to make provisions for the defense of his pawn on b5. Thus, by inserting the moves queen to c2 and bishop to d6, white has managed to slightly complicate black's ability to bring the pawn out to the c5 square. And as part of a domino effect, White has therefore managed to continue depriving the light squared bishop on c8 of some of its useful squares. Now in the game, black played the most common move here, bishop to b7, and I continued with rook to d1. And the idea of this move is that white is now threatening to play pawn to e4, and under these conditions, black will not be able to reply with pawn to e5, since the rook's placement on d1 guarantees that white wins a piece after pawn takes pawn on e5, as after either bishop takes e5, knight takes e5, 
or knight takes e5, knight takes e5. In both cases, there's a pin on the queen on d8 against the rook on d1, and therefore white will win at least a piece. Thus, with the move pawn, rook to d1, white is threatening to play e4, and then the pawn will surely make it up to the e5 square, since black cannot reply with the move pawn to e5. And for this reason, black most commonly takes this opportunity to move his queen away from the d8 square so that there will no longer be any question of a pin along the d file. One option is to play the move queen to c7, and this is rather common. But in this game, black played the move queen to b8, another alternative here. Now, while this move has the downside of continuing to block in the rook on a8, there are some advantages to this particular move order of bringing the queen to the b8 square. In particular, there will be some variations where black will benefit from the fact that any knight move landing on the b5 square will not attack the queen on c7, and also there are lines where the queen's placement on c7 allows white some tactics such as knight takes b5 based on a pin down the c-file, and I'll show some examples of this in just a moment. So queen to b8 is played, white continued with pawn to e4, so just like he started out from the beginning of the opening, white has now managed to bring a duo of pawns into the center, and he's also opened up the dark squared bishop. Pawn to e5 was played, very common in this position. And now, whenever this scenario happens, either with the queen on b8 or with the queen on c7, white has a few different alternatives available. One option is to bring the bishop clear out to the g5 square immediately. Another option is to play the move pawn to g3. And by the way, black does have a threat in this position. If black had the right to move, he would be able to capture on the d4 square with pawn takes pawn on d4, and now, if white played the most natural recapture, knight takes pawn on d4, black would have opportunity to play bishop takes h2 check. And if white were to reply with rook takes d4, there are also some problems for white in this position, such as pawn to b4, followed by pawn to c5, certainly winning a pawn on the e4 square. Thus, after the move pawn to e5, it turns out that black is threatening to capture on d4, and white needs to be careful about this factor, and so the move g3 is one direct way of defending against this threat. And by using the g-pawn rather than the h-pawn, white also ensures that later on, he may be able to bring his f-pawn out to the f4 square, making use of the defense provided by the pawn on g3. Also, a third way of continuing, and this is the way that I chose in the game, is to play pawn takes pawn on e5, and then after knight takes pawn on e5, to simply play the move knight to d4, aiming the knight towards the aggressive f5 location. This is exactly how I played in the game. And now, black retreated his knight to g6, a common move here. g3 was played defending against bishop takes h2 check and preparing to bring the pawn up to f4. And now, black played the move rook to e8, simply adding some pressure to the e4 pawn and eventually hoping to play the move pawn to b4. Bishop to g5 was played, threatening to capture on f6. Bishop to e5, and now, this is a perfect example of one of the benefits of bringing the queen to b8 rather than to c7. If black had played queen to c7 and his queen was currently locationed on the c7 square, white would now be able to play the move bishop takes f6, and now black would be threatened to recapture with the g-pawn, since if he were to recapture with bishop takes f6, White could now win a pawn with knight c takes b5, making use of the queen's placement on c7 and the opportunity provided by this pin on the c pawn. However, in the game, 
Since black had chosen the move order of queen to b8 rather than bringing the queen to c7, no such opportunity applies. The move bishop takes f6 can simply be replied to with bishop takes f6. So bishop to e5 was played, and black has managed to defend the f6 knight. It doesn't appear that white should be able to play the move pawn to f4 just yet in this position, as after bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, pawn to c5, we've reached a somewhat complicated position, but it appears that white is going to lose the pawn on e4. Let's say after rook to d1, and now either knight takes e4 looks strong, or possibly pawn to b4. So white doesn't go for the move pawn to f4 just yet. Instead, I played the move knight to f5 in the game, and now begins a series of complications. Ideally, white would like to prevent black from playing the move pawn to b4, perhaps by playing pawn to a3. It would also be very nice to insert a move like pawn to b4 as well, preventing the move pawn to c5 and pawn to b4. And ideally, white would like to be able to play the move pawn to f4 when the timing allows, but he'll probably need to spend some time defending the pawn on e4 first, perhaps with bishop to f3, then bishop to g2, and then pawn to f4, pawn to e5, creating weaknesses, etc. So this is the general plan for white in this position. Black, on the other hand, would like to make use of the dynamic potential provided by the temporary weakness of the pawn on the e4 square. Currently, the pawn on e4 is protected by two pieces, and black currently has what appears to be only one attacker on the e4 square, but in fact, because he's threatening to play bishop takes c3, we might go ahead and count the bishop on e5 as a second attacker of the e4 pawn, since it's attacking one of the defenders. In other words, black is very close to capturing on the e4 point. Now, surprisingly, after some thought, black did continue with the move bishop takes c3, weakening the e4 pawn. I recaptured with queen takes c3, and from here, it's really not possible for black to capture with rook takes e4. And there are different ways that white could continue here. Probably the strongest variation would be bishop takes f6, g takes f6, queen takes f6, threatening to checkmate with queen to g7 mate. And now, after queen to f8, the move rook to d7 is extremely strong, threatening let's say after rook to e6, white could continue with knight to h6 check, queen takes h6, queen takes f7 check, king to h8, queen takes e6, and this is certainly a disaster for black as he is currently down the exchange and there are still threats against the king. So currently the move rook takes e4 is certainly off limits. But what I didn't expect black to play in this position is the very powerful move pawn to b4. And black comes very, very close to solving his difficulties in the opening after he played this move. And this is a great example of how the semi-slav can be very strong for black. This move pawn to b4 was completely unexpected and it removes the queen from her excellent location on c3 along this diagonal. Certainly, if white were continued with the move queen to d4, trying to continue to leave the queen on the diagonal, now rook takes e4 would come with tempo and there's no longer gonna be any of the tactics like bishop takes f6. So instead, white is virtually forced to capture the pawn on b4, and only now did black continue with the move knight takes e4. Now again, rook takes e4 would be mistaken, and this is what I was expecting during the game. In this case, I had in mind to play queen to b3, threatening to bring the knight to d6, and this does come very close to creating some powerful threats 
but in fact, it would have in fact been stronger to play the move queen to c3 once again. Very, very, very interesting move here. Since now, if rook takes e2, white can again continue. Bishop takes f6, g takes f6, queen takes f6, queen to f8, rook to d7, and now let's say if bishop to c8, white can win with knight to h6 check, queen takes h6, queen takes f7 check, king to h8, and rook to d8 check, leading to mate in a few. So it turns out that the move rook takes e4 can be cleverly refuted with queen to c3, offering a sacrifice of the bishop on e2 in exchange for a powerful attack against the king. But instead, black accurately continued with knight takes e4, attacking the bishop on g5 and evading all of these different problems. White retreated the bishop back to e3, and now black achieved the move pawn to c5. Now, to me, it still appeared that white had a little bit of an advantage in this position. White has a slightly better pawn structure on the queen side as his pawns are together and black's pawns are isolated. And also, white has managed to gain the bishop pair. He has a bishop on e3 and a bishop on e2. He has the dark squared bishops. Finally, his minor pieces are slightly more stable thanks to the positioning of this knight on f5, which currently does not seem to be able to be attacked, and the knight on e4 is actually still susceptible to threats like pawn to f3, when it will no longer be able to defend the pawn on c5, nor will it be able to protect the powerful square on c3, which the queen could retreat to. Now, very cleverly, before I brought the queen back to b3, First, I inserted the move queen to b5. The idea of this was actually to entice black into playing the move pawn to a6, which he did in fact play, as after the move pawn to a6, the pawn will actually end up being slightly vulnerable in certain cases. For example, after pawn to a6, queen to b3, as played in the game, now it's more difficult for black to play the move bishop to c8, which would be a good way of trying to attack this knight on f5, as now after queen takes b8, rook takes b8, knight to d6, knight takes d6, rook takes d6, rook takes b2, bishop takes a6, this would be the exact purpose of having drawn out the pawn to the a6 square. In this case, after the exchange of bishops on the a6 square, White has a slight advantage, as the A pawn is a little bit more valuable than the C pawn, as White is very close to playing rook to C6 and perhaps corralling up that pawn, and the bishop on E3 is also better placed than the knight on G6. Here, only White has winning chances, and keeping in mind that my opponent is 250 points higher in this game, it definitely appears that this is a variation he would like to avoid. Thus. By having called out this move, pawn to a6, white has managed to remove this possibility of bishop to c8 or neutralize it to a large extent. And so, black instead played the move, queen to c7, inviting white to continue now with pawn to f3. Now, at this point, I wasn't quite sure how black was going to continue. If he moves the knight away from the e4 square, he has to contend with knight to d6, when white's strategy in the opening has paid off handsomely. In fact, the best move here appears to be knight to g5, and after king f2 to go for some other kind of active move, perhaps queen to e5 in this position. A close analysis of the position reveals that after queen to e5, and then let's say queen takes b7 and queen takes f5. In this position, black has managed to achieve close to equality. His pieces have achieved active squares, and although he has some slight weaknesses on the queen side, he should be able to compensate 
with some activity against the king's side and the precarious position of white's king on f2. However, instead of going for this simple or seemingly simple retreat of knight to g5, Black revealed that he had an entirely different concept in mind by playing the move rook a to b8, a totally unexpected move here. After rook a to b8, it appears that black is leaving a piece hanging in this position, as white could now play f takes e4, bishop takes e4, and then recover the knight on f5, even emerging ahead of pawn. However, this is where things got very, very interesting in the game. After some thought, I did in fact manage to find a very nice refutation to this idea. I continued, pawn takes knight on e4, bishop takes pawn on e4, and now my opponent was thrown off his seat when instead of protecting the queen on b3, I played the move knight takes pawn on g7. The idea of this move is that I've now evacuated the knight from the f5 square with tempo so that currently, at the current moment, white is actually ahead a piece, and so therefore, if black continues with king takes g7 as he did in the game, material is equal, but I've managed to retain the bishop pair in a better pawn structure, and if black were to continue with rook takes b3, which was the whole idea of this maneuver, then after knight takes e8, white is threatening both the queen and the rook on b3, and thusly, after queen to e7, a takes b3, queen takes e8, white has two rooks for the queen, and after a simple move like bishop to g5, and there are also other winning continuations, white has a very, very strong advantage. He's threatening rook to d8, he's up two rooks for the queen, and the pawns are both hanging, and white has the bishop pair. Thus, black had simply missed this intermediate move of knight takes g7, and now suddenly the game is most certainly turning out to be in white's favor. Very tricky combination here. Black continued with king takes g7, and now black begins to go downhill. I played queen to c3 check, queen to e5 was played, not so sure this is a good move. Instead, black might have tried the move pawn to f6. After queen to e5, I continued queen takes c5, and now I'm ahead of pawn, threatening bishop to d4. And now completely unexpectedly, black played the move rook takes b2. From here on, black plays with extreme resourcefulness, again and again managing to set some kind of small tactical traps for white, but in the end, black is not successful here. So I naturally continued with bishop to d4. Rook takes e2 turned out to be my opponent's plan here. With this amazing capture, rook takes e2. Black is actually setting a very good trap here that after bishop takes e5 check, knight takes e5, queen to d4, now the possibility of playing rook to g2 check is very strong. Perhaps it could be played right away, but actually instead, black should first insert rook to e6, so that he's threatening to bring the rook to f6, and now the threat of rook to g2 check, followed by rook to f6 check, is quite strong here. In fact, this is a very dangerous idea here. And so instead of playing the move Bishop takes e5 check. White correctly inserted the move rook to e1 first, moving the rook out of this location. Since now, after rook to g2 check as played in the game, king to f1, rather than going for the queen on e5, white is actually threatening to play rook takes e4 at a moment's notice. Black correctly played rook to c2, attacking the queen. Now it was finally time for white to play bishop takes e5 check. And now comes the last major slip for black in this game. The move knight takes e5 
followed by, let's say, queen to d4, bishop to g2 check, king to g1, and now pawn to f6, removing the pin. If black would play in this way, he's very close to achieving the check knight to f3, and therefore, white would actually need to play the move rook to f1, sacrificing the exchange in order to prevent this check on f3. And after bishop takes f1, rook takes f1, black only has a slight disadvantage since he now has a rook and knight versus the queen. And this would be quite a dramatic conclusion of this tactical idea which black has set up in this position. However, instead of playing knight takes e5, bringing the knight closer to the f3 square, black played rook takes e5, queen to d4 was played, black inserted the check, bishop to g2 check, king to g1, and now pawn to f6. Now, of course, if white were to play rook takes e5, knight takes e5, this would be a very good situation for black. Again, aiming the knight at the f3 square. However, instead, white continued with queen to d7 check, king to h6 was played, and now queen to d3, attacking the rook and setting up some tactical problems for black since the rook is currently protecting the bishop on g2. And from here, white was able to simplify the game and win after rook e to c5, threatening to bring the knight into e5, rook to c1, very powerful move here, since now rook takes c1 can be met by queen d d2 check, followed by rook takes c1. So rook a to c1 was played. Knight to e5, again, very much attempting to bring this knight into f3, and black is to be congratulated for finding many ways of complicating play in this position. But now, I continue, queen takes c2, knight to f3 check, very precise move by black, and also threatening to win the game, as if white were to play king takes g2, black would now be winning after rook takes c2 check, rook takes c2, and knight takes e1 check, picking up the rook, and ending up a complete piece. So after queen takes c2, and after this move, knight to f3 check, white had to be careful to play the move, king to f2. And now, after rook takes c2 check, rook takes c2, knight takes e1, and king takes e1, white has now managed to clear the dust, white's up a clear exchange, and now we have a winning position for white, and black went on to resign 26 move later, after the A pawn managed to promote into a queen. That's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed looking at this game between me and the international master Siddharth Ravachadran. During the game, we've not only been given an opportunity to look at a very exciting tactical explosion in the semi-slav, but we've also managed to take a look at some of the subtles of the semi-slav variation. As it turns out, Currently, I'm working on a project which will be released within the next couple of weeks in which you can look at the Semislav in more detail on your iPhone or on your Android phone, and we will be looking not only at this variation, but many, many surrounding variations of the Semislav. That's all for today, and we'll see you again soon.